Today in Grand Thumb, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. The war in Ukraine has been going on for well over a year at this point, and as terrible as conflict can be, there is some very useful information to be gleaned. Now, in today's video, we're going to be going over the different types of arms that are being used in this conflict by both Russian and Ukrainian forces. What's so interesting is that, like many other conflicts, every country that wants to either test weapon that has surplus weaponry or is looking to sell weaponry is of course getting their weapons into this conflict and what's even more interesting is that this is the first time in a long time that we've had a near peer conflict what that means is two countries that are of roughly the same technological level the same level of training where they can essentially there's no overmatch so when you have a country like the United States going up against uh, you know, small militants and terror cells, that's overmatch. We have more capability, we have planes, they don't. It's not a fair fight, but when you have two forces that both have air forces, both can counter their air forces, you get into a very different type of combat. And that is certainly what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, where fighting has moved to the trenches, much like World War I, due to the fact that they cannot gain any superiority in the air or with the current technological advances that they have because they encounter them. So today we're going to be talking about which weapons are excelling, which ones are being used heavily, and we're going to be getting into it as we always do on Grand Thumb. But before we get into that, we of course have to thank the sponsors of this channel. The biggest sponsor of this channel is the Sonoran Desert Institute. If you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing, they are the people to go to. We cannot thank them enough. Uh, they're absolutely awesome. We love them, right, Micah? Yeah, we, we cuddle them. We, yeah, that, that definitely did happen. And of course, we cannot forget who? Primary Arms, and they make optics that could potentially be used in the <laughs> trenches of Ukraine. And they probably have been and are at this very moment. Yeah, so Primary Arms, Awesome optics, great price. We love to give them hell. Um, you guys have been overloading them with questions on Skittles, so we're not gonna do that to them anymore, but we do love them. They are absolutely awesome. And of course, we cannot forget USCCA if you're looking to get concealed carry insurance. They are the people to go to. We love them. They are also a big supporter of the channel. And unlike the TV you're watching this on, the camera we're filming this on, AAC ammunition is made in the United States and we cannot thank them enough. So we have a lot of different firearms that we're gonna be looking at today. And we do have to give a big shout out to Rifle Dynamics out in Las Vegas. They were awesome enough to bring these weapons out so we could look at some of the more rare weapons such as the AK-12 to ensure that we give you guys a really good informational video. So we'll be having them on a little bit later to talk about some of the more kind of obscure facts about these different types of weapons. But without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to be starting with one of the more common weapons that you're seeing among Ukrainian soldiers, and that is going to be the AK-74. For as many cool NATO weapons as you see out there, ultimately it all comes back to the AK-74, which was designed and implemented in Russia in around the 1970s. The AK-74 is a very reliable, very easily recoiling weapon. It's very soft to shoot, it's very easy to maintain, and it just has a tendency to run in adverse conditions. The AK-74 is pretty legendary, and it's for this reason that it continues to find much favor among their soldiers, and it should be noted as well that as great as the NATO weapons are, like the M4 and the Mark 18, 5.45 by 39 is an incredibly ubiquitous round out in that area. Uh, Russia's been using it for a long time as their main service ammunition, it's for that reason that the 74 continues to be used quite heavily. Now let's take a look at what the Russians are using because it's very similar in many ways. So this looks really similar. And in fact, most people really can't tell the difference, but there are a few differences here. This is an AK-74M. It was the upgrade to the AK-74. This is the typical rifle in use by the Russian military. Now, people are probably gonna argue with me because the AK-12 is coming in. By and far, you mostly see the AK-74M. So typically you will see an optics rail on the side so they can attach any type of optic or you might even see some type of top cover rail. Now the 74M is a lighter package. They did a lot of great things such as allowing for a foldable stock. It makes for a much more compact package. So that is the AK-74M. Again, they are very similar weapons. They fire the same round and that is the 5.45 by 39. 
adequately accurate rifle. Is that is that how we would say it, Micah? It's accurate. It's accurate enough. Okay, okay, let's try it right now. Ready? Yeah. So we have a target at eh, like 100 right there. Let's give it a shot. I guess that last shot was like 220. It can do it. It's got, it's got that dog in it. However, Russia has adopted a new rifle, so let's take a quick look at that one. The AK-12. We did a review on this, as did Brandon Herrera a while back. And I think Oxide said it best as far as its adoption. Was it really necessary? Maybe not, but it's like a wife asking for a new kitchen. Do you need a new kitchen? Not really, but she's asking for it, so you're gonna get it. We'll talk about it in a little bit, but there have been some really good upgrade packages that have been designed for the AK platform. The AK-12 doesn't really follow a lot of those design cues and kind of has done its own thing. It's a good rifle, it's just, it's lacking in many areas, and we have the AK-12, it is actively being fielded in the conflict. So you can see here on the top, we obviously do have an optics rail that was sorely needed on the AK platform, but it's not the best system for retaining zero with an optic. And then on the handguard, it does have Picatinny. However, it's not a very solid lockup, so it's not great for retaining zero on IR lasers or anything like that. So the upgrades are there. They just weren't implemented in the best possible way. And we'll talk about that when we compare those to Zenico parts and that type of thing. The stock is very M4-like. However, it does not fit M4 stocks. It is its own design because, because Russia. Is that a good way of saying it? Yeah. But we have safe, we have auto, we have two round burst, and then we have semi at the very bottom there. And much like many AK upgrades that you've seen in the States, you do have that little, uh, finger selector right here and the idea being that instead of having to reach your whole hand forward onto the front ledge you can now just sweep it with your finger in order to get onto that weapon you can also hear how slow the ak-12 is on its cyclic rate compared to the um, ak-74 much slower much more controllable it is a very comfortable weapon to fire just a few things that kind of irk me about it when we compare it to like the Zenico parts. So these are the three main rifles that we're seeing in the conflict. The AK-74 on the Ukrainian side, the AK-74M with Russia, and of course the AK-12 that you're seeing with a lot of the more specialized soldiers. These are the main rifles of the conflict simply due to parts and the amount of ammo that's available. That being said, you have a lot of arms and the conflict that are being seen in good numbers. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at some of those more interesting rifles. So right here, we have two of the shorter Kalashnikov variants. This is the 104 and we have the 105. Um, they're interesting in many ways, but let's take a few shots of them, show you how those are working. Now this particular guy obviously is not a 545. This is a 762 by 39. So that is firing the typical round that you're seeing from the AKM. Those are seen in some numbers on both sides of the conflict. These are just, this is just a shortened variant. There's not a whole lot to say about it other than you're gonna see some amount of these. Right here we have the AK-105. The Sheshins use it. It's a very interesting system for several reasons. You're seeing a lot of Zenico parts on the AK-105. So what I mean by Zenico parts is Zenico is a Russian company that makes this upgrade system for the AK. And what's really interesting about it is one, that the handguard does retain zero so you can run both lasers or anything that you need that needs to have some type of zero on it. And then the optics rail is mounted into the handguard which is a very solid lockup to ensure that your optics are going to retain zero. So when I was talking about the AK-12 maybe not following a lot of the design cues, in many ways, I look at the Zenico upgrades, kind of like the Block 2 M4 uh, system, where it was a really good upgrade package for the M4, and yet you see the military mostly going with the M4A1. Pretty equivalent between the two. The Zenico upgrades that you see on the AK-105 and on just AK platforms in general is an incredible upgrade to the system that both reduces parts wear, increases accuracy of the weapon system. It's just a very good upgrade, and you just don't see as many of them most likely due to the fact that the Zenico parts are expensive and the company isn't just able to keep up with everything going on in the war. We have the Krikov. It's a very short AK. We've done a video on it. 
and you're seeing them a lot with RPK mags. Small gun, a lot of firepower. You're seeing these heavily used in urban areas. Very controllable. Uh, I really do love the crank. It's one of my favorite guns. Yours too, Micah, right? Next up, we have the RPK. The RPK is really interesting. It's still firing a 545 in many ways. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a saw, but much more maneuverable. Can't fire as long. It's a very interesting concept. We don't really have a good analog of it in the United States, except for the M27, which isn't really a great comparison. But you can see how effective it is. We have a target about 150. You'll see how good the base of fire is. It just doesn't move. It's an incredibly effective weapon. And again, with the longer barrel, you do have an extended range. So you truly are able to not just have a beaten zone, which is where the rounds are landing, but have good, accurate fire out past 500 to about 600, where either your beaten zone is getting more into that 700 meter area. And what's cool about these RPK mags is that they fit in all AKs. Good old PKM. There is no better machine gun in my mind. It is just the best. Peak, peak KM. The PKM is a very interesting weapon. Now, right here, you can see that we have a weapon that has been completely upgraded with Zenico parts. Again, Zenico kind of pushing the boundaries on the Russian weapon systems. The PKM weighs like 16 pounds compared to its competitor, the MQ-40, which weighs close to 21, 22. So it's a very versatile, very lightweight, very accurate weapon. Pretty sure I can hit it at 540. You, you said I couldn't, do you think I can? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can do it. I mean, 540, just kind of shooting at a hillside with a red dot, and it was pretty easy to make an impact. And those splashes from the uh, from the 7.62 by 54R, I mean, it's got some power. It's just a wonderful, wonderful GPMG. So right here we have a Tiger, which is about as close to a Dragunov as you're going to get outside of Russia. These are heavily used, and they are phenomenal DMRs. They are used in a sniper role often and they are definitely capable of making those about 800, 900 meter shots fairly accurately. Now we did have some issues with ours and when we were trying to get some accuracy out of it, but the problem in the United States is it's kind of hard to get good, accurate ammo for 7.62 by 5.4R. That is not a problem over near Russia and Ukraine. So these weapons are used to great effect. We're not gonna go too much into this and it's kind of, we kind of baby it a little bit. It's, yeah. it's, it's a prized possession, but we do have the SCD, which is a very cool rifle that we of course have to talk about. Now, before we get into the NATO weapons, there are a lot of very odd weapons that have found their way into the conflict. And this is due to the fact that there were just a lot of them made, there's a lot of ammo for them. And oddly enough, we have the STG-44 once again fighting the Russians. I don't know, life is a, is a flat circle, Micah, you know, it just, everything, history just repeats itself over and over. We're gonna go ahead, oh, she did. She did not like that. STG-44, if you're not familiar with this weapon, it was one of the first, what you'd call assault rifles. It is a magazine fed in an intermediate caliber and had much more what we'd consider modern controls. Now these weapons, just due to the fact that so many were captured at the end of World War II, have found their way into every conflict and that does include Ukraine. Just insane. Like a weapon made in 1944, just still out there. How? It's German magic, space magic. Ah, German space magic. This isn't, I would say, the most surprising gun out there. The next one's definitely a little bit more surprising to me. You think this is a good gun? Yes, okay. you think it's not a good gun? <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't a good gun. No, you said it's a piece of shit. It's a garbage rod. That gun's Let's brain. see if it shoots. You tell me if it's a piece of shit. Oh Lord. Ah, oh, it's a piece <laughs> of shit. <laughs> PPSH-41, somehow just its will to live, just outliving World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, every conflict known to mankind, and once again, rearing its shitty little head. Stop 
nice to it. In Ukraine. How? So the PPSH-41 is chambered in 762 by 25 which is actually a pretty spicy round if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and it has an insane rate of fire. It's just a bullet hose. And a lot of these came with drum mags. It just is a actually a fairly good close combat weapon. The only problem being that you don't have any way to mount optics because it was made in you know the 1940s. But with a little bit of ingenuity and JV weld, you're gonna have yourself a wonderful CQB weapon. And it was actually so fun to fire, I think I need to do another magazine. And you too. Yeah. yeah. Should we see who has a better group? Yeah. Okay. Hey, I, want, I have a question for you. He's got a question. If you don't win, what? What do I win? I don't have a lot, but you can, you can take whatever, man. <laughs> see? Tell me that's a piece of shit. That no, is... I, I, I love that, actually. Yeah. That is so C controlled. Come here. Come, here. Come, come take a look at that. That is... That so is awesome. I walked up as I like figured out the recoil and then it just... For how fast it is, you know, you'd expect like more of a string. Can you imagine just a, some poor German in World War II like just trying to get like Borscht and like Stalingrad just yeah. like start just getting... Maybe like just found some chocolate and cigarettes. Yeah, so like, <laughs> some cocaine, yeah. whatever it was and just... No, you win. Took me for a ride. Oh, I get the LMT. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> My only 308. What's funny is uh, your group went like this. It's actually kind of cute. It went like spiraled. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's mostly because my trigger finger was moving so fast. Like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very fast semi-auto. It's like the uh, the spiral from Moana. I've been watching my my kids have been watching the shit out of that show. Yeah, I love Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I know. What's his real name? Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Oh. You ready? Right here, we have the Bren 2. Now, this is the 16-inch variant. Typically, what you're seeing on the Ukrainian side is the 14 or the shorter variants. The Bren 2 is a really, really interesting rifle because originally, we had the Bren 805, which did so-so. From talking to the guys who are currently using them, they're not a huge fan of them, but the Bren 2, you've seen used very heavily. Many people are calling the Bren 2 kind of the the new AK of kind of the firearm world. It's cheap to make, it's incredibly accurate, it's incredibly reliable, and it's just a good system. The triggers are good, it just operates with most of the NATO technology that's already out there, such as a Stenag, and it's ready for optics, it can mount lasers, it is just a good, simple system. The Bren 2 has a charging handle can, that can easily switch to the right or left side in the field, it's very easy to do. It is an AR-18 system, which is extremely reliable, I think it's really interesting that these rifles are being so heavily tested, I would say, in this conflict because it's an unproven rifle and I would see in many ways it's being vetted by this conflict itself. So we have what I would consider an emerging really good weapon platform. So there are of course a lot of the AKs and the LMGs and the GPMGs, but what's slowly gaining a lot of relevancy in this conflict are battle rifles and that's due to the fact that the distances that they're engaging each other at. So one of the weapons that's been used quite a bit has been the SCAR-H, which has found new favor in this conflict. So we'll take a few t uh, shots here and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. So we've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of the men who are fighting for Ukraine, and there is great favor with the SCAR-H. This is due to the uh, amount of 308 that is currently being imported into the country, much of it match grade and also due to the reliability of the SCAR-H as well as the accuracy that this weapon system has. Now, most of them are using the variant with a 16-inch barrel. This is the 13-inch barrel, a shorter model. Both are used, but I thought it was pretty interesting that you're kind of seeing this resurgence of the SCAR-H because it was otherwise kind of a lackluster program that never really took off within the United States military. But it's found a lot of favor due to the ballistics of the 308. It just, as as the guy quoted me, I'm just a straight quote, big wet holes. And of course, a literal ton of M4A1s, M4s, and M16s are being imported to the country. There are just a lot. It's, you guys know what it is. You're very familiar with it. And despite us being like it's lame, we all know what it is. The M4 is a devastatingly accurate, reliable, and compact weapon system. 
you know, as much as you want to not like it because we, we just, we see it everywhere, it, it is finding a lot of favor. And especially the Mark 18, which is a short barreled variant. Discussing M4s on this channel, We've talked about it ad nauseum, so we're not going to get into it. Let's talk about some of the other interesting weapons out there. One of the most interesting weapons to be involved in the conflict, I think, is the Belgian-made FNFNC, donated by Belgium. Uh, what's the moniker? Not, not just not just waffles, right? Also, Stroop waffles, also too. Stroop, oh, those are hella good, actually. Those are super good. FNC is a very interesting weapon. In fact, one of my favorite. I've I tried for a long time to get one of these, so I was very happy when I did. It wasn't like the most successful rifle. It was used in the military, unlike the AR-18. But a lot of rifles took a lot of design cues from this specific weapon, such as the AK-5 and the AK-5C, both in use by Sweden. So it is a very proven, very reliable rifle, but they never ended up seeing as much conflict to say at M4. So a whole mess of these just being donated to the Ukrainian conflict against Russia has you know, resulted in these being used more so than ever before. And it is a very good rifle. One thing to note is it's really easy to switch from the normal to the adverse gas setting. So we have this little fin right here. So we're normal right here. If you push it over, it's going to allow more gas to get into the system in case it's getting dirty or you're in a tough environment, and then it's just going to gas that rifle a little bit harder. And then of course, if for, for some reason you have them, you can throw up this grenade sight. It does have a rifle mounted grenade that we use a blank to launch the grenade, but those obviously aren't seen as much. So we have the FN, FNC. Talk is cheap, ammunition is very expensive on a lot of these weapons. So we're gonna do something interesting, Micah. What are we doing? You get to choose any weapon, but you don't know what the drill's gonna be. In fact, Blake's gonna choose a drill. What gun, what gun do you choose? I'm choosing the, the PPSH-41. The, 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 the PSH-41. The PSH-41, okay. I choose the uh, SCG-44. Dude, Oh. it's like the Battle of the Bulge, but instead it's the Battle of the Bulges. <laughs> Blake is about to tell us the drill. However, he is crippled by uh, crippling social anxiety. Yeah. Okay, from, from the first position, barricade? Yeah. yeah. One on each target. Just one. One one shot. One. How am I gonna do that? One that's shot. Not my problem. How how am I gonna that's fire not my, one that's shot? Literally not my problem. One okay. shot, everybody knows the rules. Okay, one shot per. One on each. Bing, 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 bing. Run to that barricade. Okay. And then just dump on that first target. That how guy right there? Yeah. yeah, how many? At least five. Oh, you win. You're the one who chose the sh sh 41. <sighs> Go home, dude. Are you ready? Yeah. Stand by. Beep. That's ridiculous. You got like 10 hits. Shoot, are you ready? Yeah. Beep. Jesus! I believe. Like four. Yeah, right. <laughs> you got it. Next up, we have the uh, AK-12. Same drill. And then the crank. Are you ready? Yeah. Stand by. Come on, get him full auto. God, it's pretty good. It's kind of hard to gauge where that's at with that little finger thing, huh? You, you know, uh, I, I'm so used to optics that I went to go wrap it like an M4. And it blocked your Yeah, it but it's a peak sight. Like, so that's I, my finger. So I had to like go back down yeah. and I couldn't control it as well. Shooter, are you ready? Did you start safety on? Yeah. Stand by. Up. Full auto, full auto. You missed every shot. 
No way! You missed every single shot. Shut up! That's not possible, I was aiming right at it. <laughs> So we have to give a big thank you to Conflict Observer for a lot of the information, a lot of the photos that we're using in today's video, and then uh, to the soldiers and to the volunteers from Ukraine who have been able to talk with us about things that are going on, the weapons they're using, their experiences. I think out of everything, the most interesting thing to me is the resurgence of the battle rifle, most likely due to the proliferation of armor, the ranges that they're engaging each other, but we still do see a lot of short range weapons being used due to the intensity of trench fighting that is occurring. It's a very interesting conflict, as terrible as it is, there is always something to learn. Try to glean the information that is necessary because it could be important at some point in the future, hopefully not, but you never know. Guys, get training, train, hang with your friends, and train together. Know the capabilities of your rifles, understand the capabilities of your equipment. If at some point it becomes necessary that information needs to be used, it's better to be, how do they say it, Micah? It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Is that the adage? Yeah. That's it. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you guys so much.